the fourth Arbitron in a row. WABC has more listeners than any other talk station in New York and America. Arbitron TSA Winter 93. Expressed by the host on this show are now heard by upwards of 18 million people. This is a special edition of the Rush Limbaugh program, America Held Hostage. And now, from our studios in New York City, here is Rush Limbaugh. Thank you, John Donovan. Day 101 of the Raw Deal. Ladies and gentlemen, the Clinton presidency rolls on. But it doesn't matter. The Doctor of Democracy is here from the Limbaugh Institute for Advanced Conservative Studies. We're all smiling, so join us, won't you? Live from New York, it's Open Line Friday! right oh, that means the callers have a, a little bit more leeway in choosing subject matter today. Go ahead and line on up. Bo Snurdly, official screener of calls, standing by even as we speak, answering your calls and perhaps putting you on the air. It's the Rush Limbaugh program here in New York, but as long as I'm here, it doesn't really matter where here is, does it? Not at all. 800-282-2882. I'll tell you, folks, I'm zapped. It's been, uh, it's been an incredible week. There's one of these, some, sometimes on Fridays, we all, it just, we sit here and it's just like a... Whew, big sigh of relief because all we have to do is our real job today. All we have is our regular eight-hour day. It's like a vacation day today. We're here. To, it really, it, it, every once in a while, this just happens. I mean, it's just been, I have not had, um, is another late night last night, about uh, three o'clock. And uh, some of it was work, yes. Some of, yes, of, everything I do is work. When are you going to figure that out? Everything I do to some extent or another, has work involved in it. I mentioned that uh, this program is now heard by over 18 million people. We um, don't want to go into too much detail here because it uh, will sound a bit too self-serving. Suffice it to say, ladies and gentlemen, the latest data that we have from the most recent rating period, January, February, March, there are now about, this is going to be accurate to the penny in a couple of weeks, but we can approximate it. 4.6 million people tuning into the show at any one time. 4.6 million at any one time, and that will add up to over 18 million a week. As we proceed on down the path, let's have an update on Coco's at Fort Walton Beach, Florida. As you know, they have a rush room at Coco's in Fort Walton Beach, and the proprietor of the restaurant was pressured into closing it by a bunch of open-minded and tolerant liberals who called and made threats of various nature. The guy said, ah, hell, I don't need this, and he closed it down. That angered people who support this program and who wanted there to be a rush room, and so their numbers far exceeded those complaining. I mean, it wasn't even close. And so the rush room at Coco's in Fort Walton Beach actually will open on Tuesday. They're taking reservations. They've gotten calls yesterday. And this, I'll tell you, this is heartwarming. And it is sobering uh, to me. I, I never will ever, ever take things like this for granted. I want you to always know that. The, uh, the restaurant at, uh, at Fort Walton Beach, Coco's, has received calls from every state in the Union except Alaska. Every state in the Union, they have received calls from people wishing to support the restaurant. And uh, the, in, in fact, there was one interesting call. For, they had calls from Cuba, ladies and gentlemen. I was told today they got a couple calls from Cuba. Uh, probably people, hey, can, if I make reservations, can I get out of here? There was one interesting call about which I was told uh, somebody, a pistachio nut farmer in Texas, called in and said, Can you give me the names of those liberals that Rush was saying tried to shut down your establishment? And they said, Sorry, I can't do that, sir. I'm not... Uh... No, no, you don't understand. I want to send them $25 gift certificates. I want to get their butts back in there and enjoy your food. 
And see, that's the difference, ladies and gentlemen, between the liberals and conservatives. Conservative didn't want to call and harass the liberals. He wanted to, come on, join us and have a good time. Send them a $25 gift to So I, safe to say that the rush room at Fort Walton Beach, the Cocos there, is now going uh, to be alive and well. And thank you again ever so much. That's, as I say, heartwarming. A little a hodgepodge of stuff in the news today. I've, it's, it's a Friday. It's lighthearted, and I don't sense any huge major deal going on. The 100 days... Uh, has passed in all the analyses and report cards. Health care is, uh, uh, again, rearing its ugly head. Interesting story in the New York Times yesterday. Headline, Hillary Clinton rejects delay in health plan. Remember, this, this, this goes back to the, earlier in the week when Leon Panetta left the reservation, left the commune due to bad karma and decided that, hey, i got to tell these guys something. You know, it, <coughs> it's interesting, too, because there are two reactions to Panetta. Inside the White House, uh, they're gnashing their teeth over what Leon Panetta did. Outside the White House, but in Washington, he's being treated as a hero, which is confounding those inside the White House, because they figure somebody's giving them some good advice. Hey, focus on just one or two things and get those done, and then move on to something else and do it that way instead of just trying to do everything at once for whatever reasons. And one of Panetta's pieces of advice was this healthcare thing, look, shelve it for a while. It isn't going to happen this year. You got too many other things. Getting your budget in is going to be more than you have time for. And you've got gays in the military, women in combat, Bosnia, healthcare, and all these other things. He said, drop them. Hillary Clinton responded. Headline, Hillary Clinton rejects delay in health plan. She's the head of the task force. Hillary Rodham Clinton, who heads the White House Task Force on Health Care, rejected suggestions that releasing an ambitious plan while the administration's similarly ambitious budget was awaiting passage by Congress would risk rejection of both efforts. We're still proceeding as planned, said Mrs. Clinton. We are working as hard as we can, and there is no delay in what we're doing. I... Um, I'm looking here for the president's uh, response uh, to here. I'm not going to present something to the president until I'm sure that we have numbers that will withstand analysis, she said. Frankly, the task of getting the various pieces of the federal government in one room to create all the numbers has been very difficult, but we've made a lot of progress. And I still think that they've had it in their minds what they're going to do with this health care plan anyway, and all this has been just a big public exercise to convince people that they're actually working on it now, when in fact they've had their idea long ago. Uh, editorial cartoon, New York Post. A woman with a rather large nose, and I don't know why she's been caricatured with a large nose here, but she is looking through the periscope viewfinder of a submarine. In her sights are an, is another U.S. ship. And through the periscope viewfinder, you see the captain of the ship that she's looking at looking back at her through binoculars with a couple of sailors looking scared out of their minds standing next to him. The captain says, as he's looking through his binoculars, What the hell is she aiming at? Uh-oh, don't tell me it's that time of the month again. <laughs> We'll show you this on TV next week. <laughs> this is pretty bold and brazen. <laughs> pretty stereotypical, uh, uh, don't you think? New York Post also has an exclusive today that the president uh, uh, may avoid including abortion coverage in their health plan. Now, remember, the president promised this. The president and Al Gore both have said that no national health care plan would be complete without, without a fully funded provision for abortion on demand. Now, they don't call it that. They don't call it abortion on demand because it would be too negative. It's what it is, but they don't call it that. They're going to have federally funded abortions as part of the health care plan, and now it looks like they're not. And the headline of the post is, Prez may backtrack on abortion funding. So there's that discussed. More of the same kind of behavior at the campus of the University of, well, actually, this is Penn State. This is Penn State, where the uh, opponents of the student newspaper have again taken some copies. This time, rather than just throwing them away, they've burned them. 
And so um, the political correctness, political cleansing uh, of liberalism versus conservatism continues on Verage College campus. What else? We have, it's, just, it's a lot of fun, lighthearted stuff here today, plus uh, your phone calls. More news on the economy heading south uh, in the past uh, month, down to 1.8 percent in the Clinton administration thinks they uh, they know why it's because their stimulus package wasn't passed and that's so bogus it's under the reason why the economy is slowing down is because what they're saying they're going to do to people it's there's no mystery about it and we'll have more details and analysis also uh, a big protest is planned uh in fact it i guess it happened two days ago how come i'm getting this two days after the fact a planned protest i guess well i don't even know if i want to talk about this now because i don't even know if it happened but there was going to be a stutter in at Nike out in Anaheim. Uh, Nike was uh, they're going to open Nike Town, a uh, in Costa Mesa, call it California. The uh, it's a it's a it's a big place to sell Nike shoes, of course. And because they use who is they use Porky Pig in their ads? That's all, folks. The stuttering crowd in America is upset. The National Stuttering Project was going to go out there and have a stutter in uh, to protest the opening. Well, it could, that could be one of the longest protests in American history, uh, depending on what they want to say at their... Um, but I don't know if it happened. Now, see, they're getting this thing two days late. It's, it's uh, interesting. I'll tell you about what they were going to do anyway. So you be cool. We'll come back, take a break. Your phone calls. We'll get right to that after this. You're listening to the EIB Network on 77 WABC. Open Line Friday on the EIB Network. Rush Limbaugh with more information on the Stutter Inn at Nike Town in Costa Mesa, California. Now we have here, I, my friends, I just, I'm, I, I please do not chuckle at any of this uh, because it is not my intention to. <laughs> the National Stuttering Project here. I have received a a press release from the National stuttering project and I have read the press release from front to back I have read it through and through and for the life of me it doesn't say on here when they're going to have the stutter in it just says they're gonna do it now they do have a time for their press conference now that was a couple days ago on Wednesday but I, I, I've, I've we, we made a call we have discovered we have been told that the National Stutter Inn, or the, the Stutter Inn uh, at, um, at Nike Town in Costa Mesa, California, is going to happen when? Saturday. Saturday, what time? We, we, we don't even get it. We don't know the time. That's what I don't understand. They want all kinds of people to show up, and they haven't. I can't find out what time the Stutter Inn is. Fit, uh, I do know that there are 50,000 known stutterers in Orange County. This I know because I have read the press release. There are 50,000 known stutterers, and they've all been invited to this uh, stutter in. But you people at the National Stuttering Project, I mean, if you're going to do a protest, you are going to have to advise people when it's going to happen. Otherwise, nobody will know. This just came into us. I mean, obviously, they want us to know here at the EIB network of their plans. Let's see. <clears throat> Uh, this, is, this ran uh, in yesterday's uh, Los Angeles Times in the Orange County Newswatch section. A national stuttering project feuding with Nike over what it sees as misuse of Porky Pig in a Nike commercial will stage a stutter in. Project spokesman uh, says it'll encourage supporters to show up and stutter their heads off inside the store in... Pr <laughs> in pro... In protest. Now, there's going to be a stutter in at Nike Town in Costa Mesa. 50,000 known... Yeah, I don't know what the chant will be. Uh, I don't know if it'll be a single chant or if you can just stutter and say whatever you want. <sighs> what do you mean? What will they say at the end? At the end, that's all, folks. Well, that's really sensitive on, on the part of the EIB network. So that's how you envision them ending their stutter in, right? You know, 
<laughs> Stop laughing in there. I can hear you people laughing through two panes of glass. <laughs> oh, they've gone nuts. It's Friday and we're whacked here, folks. We're <laughs> we I have this picture. You want to hear something that's just as funny? Just you know who Edward James Olmos is? Now here's here's uh, it, whenever he's on the Arsenio show, he's always on there as the uh, he's he's what the 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 ambassador of world peace is Edward James Olmos. He's got all the answers to all the problems, to all the conflict throughout the world. And Arsenio always introduces him. Please welcome Edward James Olmos. And they go nuts in the audience. And Edward James walks out peacefully and all that. Uh, you may remember Edward James. He he spoke at the one of the inaugural galas in Washington and traced his bloodlines. I am first African. First and proudly African, and then my family migrated to wherever. It must he's got he's a mongrel. If if what he said is true, he's got so many bloodlines in there. There's a picture of Edward James Olmos being part of the the uh, the pole bearer team, carrying the casket of Caesar Chavez in uh, Delano, California, yesterday the, at the funeral. What you may not know, you people in Los Angeles know this because it's been big news out there. You people may not know this. Edward James Olmos, the ambassador of peace, the, the man, he's staunchly, staunchly in favor of gun control. He's one of these people who believes that the problem with crime is that there are too many guns and weapons out there. He applied for a permit to pack a peace. Just last week, this uh, story originally appeared. At, this is this is this the, the 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 perfect hypocrisy that exists out there. He wants a gun for what? Why would the ambassador of peace feel threatened? He needs a gun. He wants to protect himself. But but no, oh, that's our problem. Too many people with guns. And he wanted he wanted a permit to carry concealed weapon. They now they haven't granted one of those in Los Angeles in years. I think the, the I mean really the most recent person to have been granted a permit to pack a uh, concealed piece was the new police chief, Willie Williams. But nobody gets one. But he applied for one. It's a, say, it's a say, it's the Carl Rowan syndrome. Somebody breaks into your backyard, starts swimming in your pool, you go out there and shoot him. And then the next day you write a column on how we got to get guns out of the hands of people. You got it. He's been a gun control advocate all his life. And you know what else is funny about Carl Rowan? Carl Rowan owns about 12 guns for what I've told, and only one of them, only one of the 12 was unregistered. It's that one he happened to grab when he shot. <laughs> it just, <clears throat> you know, fate works in strange, mysterious ways. Cellular call. We'll start uh, in Turnpike, Ohio with Brian. Hello, sir. Mega did us, Rush. Thank I'm, you. Uh, I'm originally from Pittsburgh. I'm crossing Ohio here. Uh, first of all, we don't get your show to about 2 a.m. in Pittsburgh, and I uh, never get a chance to see your show. Tape it. Get a VCR and tape it. Well, I agree, but I'd like for him to put it on prime time like it is everywhere else, most of the places. Uh, what I was calling about is this morning, I'm almost sure it was Good Morning America. I was getting dressed to run out of the house, and Al Gore was on there with Barbara Walters. And I don't know, did you get a chance to see that this no, morning? No, no, I never watch the morning TV shows. It's just uh, nothing, nothing against them. It's just not part of my daily habit, daily routine. Well, this morning, Al Gore, you know, they were grading the administration, and uh, he gave it an A, you know, and uh, he couldn't find, you know, anything. Uh, Barbara Walters said if there's just one thing you can go to the president and say, you know, I, I would like to just change this a little bit. You know, he couldn't find anything. Well, that's no, I mean, what do you expect him to, I mean, you expect the truth from these guys? Yeah, but well, well, what burns me up is last night, I, uh, yesterday, by the way, yesterday, that, that song at the beginning of the show. Yeah, hang on. A lot of people want to hear that again. We'll hang on through the break. We'll play that song again in 100 days. All right. We're back. Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh. Back to you. The doctor of democracy. On the cutting edge of societal evolution, back to Brian on the uh, on the road in Turnpike, Ohio. This is uh, Cellular Call. All right, Brian. Let me tell you. Don't 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 sit there and expect the vice president to go on TV and start listing off the problems that they're having in their administration. If they're going to do that, they're going to blame it on the opposition party, and you shouldn't expect otherwise. Well, the only thing is, last night I went home and uh, wanted to catch all three networks last night to to see where they put, you know, the story on the 100 days and, and, and how they rated it. And, uh, you know, and, and they pushed it as far back as they could in the, in the news. They pushed it as far back in the news. And, 
And uh, now I think he's at an approval rating of 55%. The funny thing is I don't understand how he's president because I can't find anybody that voted for him anymore. And, you know, because and, I, I, my wife and I, we started a small business about eight months ago. And uh, I go out and work every day. And everybody I talk to, uh, they're very, very upset. And this is the only place to get the truth. And everybody is upset with this guy, no matter where you go or who you talk well, to. Well, I think they should be. Look, the, the only question, the only thing I can say to you people is, where were you last fall? This is nothing new. I'm going to start sounding like a broken record here, but I guess that's what it takes. You people, th there is absolutely no new behavior from the people running this administration from now to the campaign they ran. There's nothing new. Every characteristic, every technique, every attempt, every effort to sell you on something, every promise, there's nothing new here. To all of a sudden wake up in January, February, March, and April and say, gee, wish I, I, I've, been, I've been fooled. Yeah, but it's, it's just taking you too long. You were fooled. You were in the process of being fooled a year ago during the primary campaign when they pulled Hillary out of the front lines or pulled her off the front lines. I mean, you people, I mean, I'm, it's, I, I don't want to sit here and say, hey, you made your bed. Lay in it. <clears throat> but because I don't, I don't want to be mean about it. I, I, just, I, I had dinner last night with um, a journalist, and we were discussing this, and it, it, we're just amazed at, at the number of people who, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, are, are, are coming to this party late. The source of frustration, you people don't know how frustrating it can be to, to, um, to have it all figured out and to, and to tell people about it on a daily basis and then to have people not care because they're so distracted by other emotions. That being their dislike for George Bush and their overwhelming, overpowering desire to get rid of him. Uh, I, I'll tell you how this is going to manifest itself. You, you've got an administration here where they're just incapable of leveling with you because they don't know what they believe. Every day, it's float the new trial balloon of the day. Every day, it's what can we make them believe. And I think that this Bosnia situation, I got a, I got a story here, Clinton weighing airstrikes. President Clinton could decide this weekend whether to use military force to curb the killing in Bosnia-Herzegovina. UN officials Thursday said that uh, Bosnian Serbs would return to peace talks this weekend. Um, but what they're considering the military scenario would be airstrikes against Bosnian Serb military, in, uh, military positions, lifting a UN arms embargo to supply outgunned Bosnian Muslims. And uh, they're also studying a proposal to create UN havens for besieged Mos uh, Bosnian Muslims. But this... This is the exact wrong way to go about it, to start out piecemeal, to start out with less than a mission defined in response to pressure from various quarters. And I'll tell you, I, I'm going to make this prediction to you. I want to make it very quietly. They listen to this show in the White House. And we may be able to put that to our good use soon. But I'm, I'm just going to tell you, there's, there's gonna, when, when it doesn't work, if they do this Bosnian thing the way it's being reported now, if they do this with less than a mission with less than victory defined, and with less than full commitment to that victory, there's going to be something that's going to go wrong somewhere. Not because it's Bill Clinton, but because you don't do military operations this way. It would go wrong no matter who decided to do it this way. And what's going to happen is that you're going to see... Here's, man just is incapable of accepting responsibility for things. What's going to, you're going to see him come out of this thing, well, the generals told me that we could do it. I put my faith and trust in the general. This Janet Reno thing is going to be repeated, folks. This, this, this Bosnian thing is, is going to be, I, I, I'm going to be playing that prediction to you over and over again. And we are being inundated with requests for our song by the Gordon Brothers that was prepared exclusively for us at the EIB Network, the President's First 100 Days. So in response to that public demand, we play it again. Inauguration, fireworks, celebration, lifting, gag rule, Chelsea in private school, misjudge, deficit, tax the old, soak the rich, guess we should have known, he's a Jimmy Carter clone. Bill Clinton is a liar, now we see he's yearning to take all we're earning. Bill Clinton is a liar, if you got money, hide it, cause he's gonna find it. 
is like a laser beam in your pre-election dream pork filled jobs bill gop block hillary healthcare al gore nowhere you is going deeper into hawk speeches sermonized taking both sides white house jogging track burn off big mac zoe nanny gate kimba playmate waco reno inferno she didn't stop the fire on the job she's learning while the cult was burning when clinton saw the fire right away he knew it once again he blew it ibm gm economy slips again new figures new facts lower spending higher tax health care spending cut economic blood and guts taxes for the middle class clinton blow it out just facts <laughs> Refugees with HIV, rented vans, TNT, Haitians immigrate, they are shock bait. New men in Marines, hairdressers, closet queens, governor from Arkansas, what else do you have in store? Clinton spots on fire, all the heat he's taking has his rear end bacon. Clinton spots on fire, this is day 100 and his days are numbered. There you have it, the Gordon Brothers, and a song has been overwhelmingly demanded to be heard again by members of this audience. One other thing about Bosnia. My friends, irony is such a marvelous thing to behold. May we look at the military and what's happening there for just a second? Look, look what's going on. First thing we've got is a bunch of changes being made in how the military is to be structured we're going to have women in combat because the military powers that be realize they can't stop this freight train, and so they're, they're getting on board. The next thing we've got, we have this pressure from the uh, gay and lesbian community to allow them to join the army to lift the ban on gays in the military. Then we have the administration which uh, it believes fundamentally the military needs to be cut way back, downsized, and reoriented. At the same time, we are preparing to involve ourselves in what could be the most bloody, the deadliest, and most protracted conflict that we have experienced in a long time. Now, the people who want women in combat oppose combat. They don't want combat. I don't believe that anybody the, the, the vast majority of people ever really want to go to war when they join the military. Now, we ought to applaud them for their courage when it happens after they volunteered because they don't quit, they don't run off, and that's why we call them courageous and brave. They do things that most people wouldn't. But face it, in a voluntary situation, most people do not join thinking they're going to go off to war. I can just see it now. Here, we, here, here Clinton is going to lift the ban on gays in the military in June just in time so the gays who join can go to Bosnia and fight a war. Now, how many of them are going to join? And how many women are going to f are file in and join uh, to go to... Who... This whole... It just... It, the, the irony here is just lovely. I can see a meeting in the White House between women activists and gay activists in the present. Boy, this is really dirty of you, Mr. President. You lift the ban on gays, you put women in combat, and then you have the biggest war in U.S. history since Vietnam. You're making it impossible for us to join. You're making it impossible for us to become parts of the military. Well, I thought you wanted to go to combat. I thought, I thought you wanted to serve your country. Well, I mean, we have to sell it that way, Mr. President, but that's not what we really want. This is going to prove it. <laughs> this is going to prove it, folks. You, know, you get the irony of this? I, tell you, I just, I, I, and this is, you see this kind of stuff happen, you think of it this way, and you think, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing to see the, 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 what fate alone has done to, to these young socialist utopian idealists who are going to regularly be confounded by reality. And they're not going to hold it not to deal with it because they've been running from it. That's, that's exactly what socialist utopians do. They run from reality. They don't like the rigors of the real world, so they form communes out of the way so they can live their lives in peace and harmony. And they go to the tops of mountains and they go, home, oh, oh, home. The new harmonic convergence are worshiping trees, birds, blades of grass, because they can't. That's what the peace movement was all about. It was due to their inability to face the hard, cold realities of a protracted conflict. So they turned their little movement into a religion. What's a religion do? A religion, among other things, helps you come up with a way to deal with the unknown. Particularly the unknown of your own mortality. 
And so that's what we've got in the White House now. A bunch of people who ran from reality, tried to redefine it with their good intentions and their care and concern and compassion, and they're confounded by it each and every day. Witness the time frame of the events involving our military. They're cutting it to ribbons. They're closing bases left and right. They've got to cut the number of people in it. 2.7 million people losing their jobs. The research and development that we have spent in this country has been primarily focused on the military. Now we're going to have women in combat roles, and we're going to lift the ban on gays in the military. At the same time, these people are leading us, perhaps, into a quagmire. We'll be back in a moment. You're listening to the EIP Network on 77 WABC. Back to the phones we go on Open Line Friday. Callers choose the topics. Rush Limbaugh in New York on the EIB Network to Cincinnati. This is Craig. Welcome, sir. Greetings, Rush, and unlimited dittos from the epicenter of conservatism. In Thank Cincinnati. you. Thank you. Uh, curious about what you uh, what your opinion is about uh, Clinton's uh, student loan program proposals. Well, you, uh, you you mean the whole thing where he wants uh, he wants to offer uh, thirteen thousand dollars in tuition credit uh, in exchange for two years of community service or government service, that kind of thing. That is the idea. Yeah. Yeah. I um. Look, before I answer this, I have an answer to it, but the problem is when I answer something, when I say something about something, that says it all. There's not much left to say. Well, I wonder what you think about it. That's what Open Line Friday is about in large. What do you think about it? Well, you know, I think there, from my perspective, there are two sides of the coin. The, the, the foolish and idealistic and naive side of me wants to believe that if you create a program like this, that in a sense, at least in theory, mirrors what benefits could come from being in the military, that is some form of both service and self-discipline, that... If the program is actually run well, that people um, could get an education, could be trained uh, to benefit the economy, and um, and be actually sought as as productive workers on the other side. Of course, the the problem is that uh, the government rarely, if ever, runs anything in an effective manner, and there are two particular problems with it. One is that they're they're having to get into the finance business of loaning money and administ ad ad administrating that plus administering a, a whole um, uh, service-oriented uh, uh, job corps type of thing. So you, really, they're talking about two potential boondoggles there. So well, I think your first take is accurate when you talk about the idealism, the naivete behind it, the, uh, the utopianism. Uh, that's what's driving Clinton. Uh, and, and people who, I think, who believe in this kind of uh, program working. I agree with you that the, um, as is the case with so much of liberalism, which I remind people is one of the most gutless choices you could make in life, is very easy. It, it, to have good intentions and to want something to work out well is very, very easy. The question is, will it work? Now, the reason you, you people may be wondering why they've come up with this $13,000 as the average figure that they're going to apply toward a college education. They figure that that's... They've, done, they've run some numbers, and that's what the average debt is. That's, of course, way below the total cost for tuition in a major university. But that's what the average debt is that the average student has upon graduation from the average institution. So what they're trying to do is come up with that figure, and, and then they want two years of, uh, of government service, community service, undefined right now, as is so much of the whole program, undefined. So the benefits to be accrued are, uh, are, are dubious and questionable. And, and I agree with you, it would be fine if they could run it with the discipline of the military, but they won't be able to. It's, it's not going to be a uni organization or a monolithic organization with uh, chains of command like exist in the military. I don't think, it's, I, I don't think it would hold up anyway. What do you what do, you do if somebody, uh, you've you got to make them do the community service first, I would think. To get to get the thirteen grand, if you if you give them the education first, and uh, and then say, all right, we'll give you the thirteen grand to pay it off, and then tell them go out there for their for their two years of service, and they quit after a year or whatever. Uh, what are you, what are you going to do? I mean, I I think it, it it defeats the purpose. It's also I think too intricate a social engineering project, and it certainly expands government, and it's going to cost a hell of a lot more than the student loan program does today. And I think that at the bottom of this, I hate to be cynical, 
But I think at the very root of this is the desire, this administration, to get more and more people, as many as he can, depending on some largesse from the government for something meaningful in their lives. And I really worry when, when, when something meaningful in your life uh, is deemed to be able to come only from government. You start creating that kind of dependence and that kind of anticipation, and all the education and training in the world you want is, is going to counteract be counteracted by this notion that the government is making you who you are. I just, I, I, he wants more government, bigger government, government must do more, that's wrong, government must do less, and anything he wants to do that expands government, I'm going to oppose. Especially something as intimately involved in somebody's life as this. We'll take a break. If, you, know, you want to fund a college education, there are other ways that we can talk about this. Be creative. I mean, let, let's just not assume that government has to come up with the answers to all these things. They don't. Back in a moment. You're listening to the EIB Network on 77 WABC. It's timely. It's informative. It's interesting. It's educational. It's enlightening. It is educational. Did I say educational? I said edu it's educational. It's all of these things and more. What? Oh, pray you ask. Do I refer to? I refer to the conservative chronicle. As you know, a charter advertiser of the Rush Limbaugh program. You are conservative, even if you're not conservative, even if you're liberal and you want to know the heart of conservatism, that's the conservative chronicle. Because every conservative newspaper columnist and thinker published in America today is published in compendium form every week in the conservative chronicle. This is it. This is the only source to find out what all of these brilliant thinkers think. Opinion based with fact is unstoppable when it comes from conservatives. The Conservative Chronicle gets 39 bucks a year for 52 issues every year. 800-888-3039 is the number. That's 1-800-888-3039. Call them now. Hello. Oh, uh, hi, Fred. Right. Yeah, a new Xerox copier. No, it didn't cost a lot. Fred, how do you know I've got a new Xerox copier? You're where? The roof across the street... You saw them deliver it at 1,100 hours. Is that you up there next to the pigeons? You must be the one with the binoculars. Uh, no, it was just a lucky guess, Fred. Well, if you must know, I'm leasing my Xerox copier. Uh, it works out to about $25 a week, and the service is included for the first three years. That's right, I said years. You know, Fred, leasing a Xerox copier is no secret. You don't have to spy on people to get the information. Just call Xerox. What are you looking at now? Fred, you could get arrested for that. To find a reliable copier for as little as $25 a week, take another look. It's Xerox, the document company. For a local office, call 1-800-ASK-XEROX. Putting it together. You may not have much in common with a deadbeat. You are the biggest scum on earth. Or a transsexual. It's not necessary that everybody knows, so, you know, why tell them? But you might if you had an identical twin. It's double the trouble. Today at 4 on Channel 2, the audience, the guests, they are all twins. But they're telling the kinds of stories that can't be duplicated. Join me for Dead Ringers, Twisted Tales of Twins on Geraldo. Geraldo, today at 4 on Channel 2. It's the most treacherous place in the city. You pray. I pray all the time. With danger at every turn. Do you know how many funerals I've been to in this neighborhood? And death just around the corner. It's the intersection. And every time you step off the curb, you take your life into your own hands. Tonight, Channel 2 News shows you how New York streets have become the most dangerous in the nation. So don't walk until you watch. Fatal Crossings, tonight at 11, only on Channel 2 News. Adrian Berg, tomorrow afternoon, 1 till 4, on 77 WABC. my brain tied behind my back. Rush Limbaugh and the Excellence in Broadcasting Network. 600 radio stations, ladies and gentlemen. And 4.6 million people tuning in at any one time. I have just arrived at a programming, executive programming decision. We are going in the last hour of the show, in the interest of balance, in the interest of fairness, in the interest of goodwill, in the interest of diversity... In the interests of inclusion, we are going to attempt to take calls only in the third hour from people who 
have, have satisfaction to report as they analyze the first hundred days of the Clinton administration. Uh, and and I, again, whenever time we do this, you know, we have to ask people to, uh, to uh, not call so that we can leave the lines open for those who share views we specifically ask to hear. Now, I'm not looking for specific views, but we are looking for people who like this administration, who like what's gone on, who like what they see or hear, and who are eager for more. And I don't want any of you people playing tricks. I don't want you people calling, hey, I love the first hundred days because that's a hundred fewer days remaining. I don't want calls like that. I want proactive, positive calls. People, people who just love and can tell me why. It's a very important part of this, folks. Anybody can say, hey, I think the first hundred days have been good. But then is going to come from me that question, why? Please be able to say so if you call. Why do you like it? You're excited about it. You want more of what we've had the first hundred days. Do you think we'll get any calls? We're going to try, ladies and gentlemen. That's the last hour of the program today. See you in just a few minutes with more. Don't go away. W-A-B-C. Hello, Rush. Hi. Hi. Uh, I have a comment about what Clinton had to say, and that is that racism is a real problem. Mr. Clinton owes an apology not just to you, Rush, but he owes an apology to all the, black, all the black people of America. He belittled their cause by making an accusation he knew to be false, and not only that, but he expected a laugh for it. Yeah, well, I can't, I can't dispute that. There, that's why there was some uncomfortable squirming uh, after you made the comment. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't looked at it that way, but you're right. Okay. Thanks very much for the call, Judy. Okay, thanks, Rush. Tom in Corona, California. Hello. Hi, Rush. Uh, Hi. Mega Diddles uh, from the left coast. Thank you. Um, there's a talk show host out here, uh, Hugh Hewitt. Yes, he I know suggest- Hugh. I know Hugh. He has a suggestion for you. Why don't you do the radio address after Clinton? The, you mean the... Re- On Saturday afternoons? The Republican response to Yes. Him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's an interesting notion. That means like... That means he I, talked about that uh, a couple weeks ago on his radio program. He did? Oh, yeah. Huh. I, well, n- now that you mention it, I remember getting a couple notes about that, but I, I wasn't quite sure what... They, Rush, you got to do it. you got to do the Republican response. And what am I missing? I, I didn't, but they did not mention that Hugh had been the one to suggest that. Yeah, he brought it up uh, a couple weeks ago on his program. Huh. Well, I'm flattered that someone or m- that somebody would think that I would uh, be good in that role. Y- you'd kill him, let me tell you. Well, the, the Republicans are going to have somebody in Congress do their... I think Bob Michael does it. And uh, that, that's, that's going to change. You're very nice to uh, encourage me. I appreciate that. Can I say hi to a few people, correct? Yeah, go ahead. I need to say hi to all the Snyder drivers out there across the foot of plane. Snyder drivers? Yeah. And uh, Art Grossbeck and Corona. Art? And hi, baby. He's in us in the other room. Great. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. All right. Thanks, Rush. You bet. Bye-bye. Mike in Beaumont, Texas. Hello. Welcome to the Rush Limbaugh program. Hi, Rush. Hi. Uh... I think I think President, if that's what you want to call him, Clinton is, is sinking to a new low by the statement he made the other day. Uh, the particular one about you defending, you know, the, the woman. Right. Which I, I think he's in he's in a lot more trouble than that than he knows. I think there's going to be a lot of people talk about that. Well, maybe uh, now that it's gotten out, I'm. It, it was had it not been for us airing it here, this would have never made it anywhere. Uh, it I agree with that too, because they sure weren't going to let it happen. Well, no, but you got to wonder about the press in this. I mean, that, that that's this. And ostensibly, this is off the record, but C-SPAN's there televising this thing, and there are a lot of them. And and plus, you know, Bill Bennett uh, talked about this yesterday on Face the Nation. He 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 referenced it uh, yesterday, and and still it. it but was, lightly. Yeah, yeah, he did make. He kind of danced around it a little bit, I think. There. Uh, second of all, I have a comment about uh, Bryant from Texas on this, and I don't think they should be having these hearings with Janet Reno and the FBI in the ATF until this investigation is finished. I mean, is that right? Well, I agree with you, but it's... There's too many. I don't know. I can't answer that right now. It's a therapeutic process. We're all trying to beat ourselves up for what happened here. And, and what we're... This is, this is pure symbolism over substance. Exactly. What you have here are a bunch of hearings where everybody's going to blame everybody and everybody's going to accept the blame. Yeah, we all are. We're rotten people. We're going we're gonna to learn from this and we're never going to do it again. I'm going to have a couple cocktails. Well, it's costing a lot of money for uh, something I think is stupid. I think they did what they had to do. Uh, you can't second-guess decisions like that. And also, let me say, we love you down here in Southeast Thank Texas. Thank you. Thanks so much. Do not go away. No, no, no. No, 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 no. No intention whatsoever to do so. 
gosh, you know what I haven't done? That rem I haven't told you about the football game yesterday. You, you people ought to see Bennett. Bennett is an ace QB, and I have footage. I took a video camera down there, and I have footage of Bill Bennett. Our side won the game, by the way, throwing TD pass after TD pass. We, we had eight on eight. There, yeah, A bunch of people showed up. We had a live rush. I mean, pass rush. There was contact out there. You'll see it. There were cuts and scrapes. But we didn't have to kick anybody out of the league. Back in just a moment. Yeah. Mega Dittos from Nyack. Thanks a lot, sir. Hey, I just wanted to call it because um, that was a real cheap shot he took at you. Clinton, I mean. Yeah. And, you know, it was behavior unbecoming of a president. Think so, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Well, he's a new kind of Democrat. Yeah, right. Yeah, so he says, but he's not showing it. But, Rush, it's been a real honor to talk to you. It's well, thank second, you. Second biggest highlight of my life. That's right, you know, you have to leave it to me. Folks, if it weren't for me... Our snap would not know what day of the hostage crisis this is. I had, I had to use simple addition. I remembered that Thursday was 100 days. And that would mean that Friday was 101. And there had been two days since. The snap, I said, what day is it? They didn't know. But I know. That's why I'm the host. And that's why you're here. So let's get started. This is a special edition of the Rush Limbaugh program, America Held Hostage. And now, from our studios in New York City, here is Rush Limbaugh. Thank you, John Donovan. And as I said, day 104 of the Raw Deal. And it gets a little more and more raw with the passing of each day. Rush Limbaugh in New York on the Excellence in Broadcasting Network, a brand new week to kick off of Broadcast Excellence. Up late again last night, ladies and gentlemen, because I am in the throes of book two. All this requires is for me to stay informed. This is an easy write. Actually, it's not easy. But I'm, uh, I'm writing, see, I told you so. And last night, last night I had to, i tell you what I actually did last night. Last night I had to conclude an additional chapter that I am adding to the paperback version of The Way Things Ought to Be. Uh, which is slated for release or publication in September. It's the paperback version. And I have been besieged by so many people saying, hey, Rush, you know, you might want to revise and rewrite that chapter we are winning. No, I don't. No intention to rewrite or revise the chapter we are winning. And so I wrote why last night as the additional chapter, and I sent that off to the uh, publisher pocketbooks this morning. So, But I'm here bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Ladies and gentlemen, may I... I seldom uh, begin the program this way, and I seldom say what I'm about going to say, but I really would like, even though I know I have it on most occasions, you are riveted to this program and me, but I really need your attention undivided for the next uh, seven or eight minutes, if you would. As you know, I attended Saturday night in Washington the annual White House Correspondence Dinner. It's uh, held at the Washington Hilton. Uh, many people misunderstand when you tell them White House correspondents, they think that it's a dinner party at the White House. It's not. It is the White House correspondents are a particular type of press person. And uh, it's a big, big social function. And, and this year, many Hollywood celebrities descended upon the affair now that one of their own sits in the White House. You know, the old us versus them thinking. Um, as typified by Ron Silver's gazing skyward and seeing military jets and at first being angry at the sight of them and then being reminded, Ron, those are our jets now, Clinton won. Oh, yeah. The Hollywood celebrities descended in glee on Washington Sunday. Hey, we have our country back now, said they. During his remarks, which are customary, the president customarily makes remarks following the night's entertainment. This night's entertainment, by the way, provided in questionable taste by Elaine Boozler. The president, in his customary remarks, referenced me two, perhaps three times, depending on how you hear it. We're going to play the president's two references to me. But before we do, we're going to play you audio 
from Thursday last week's television show. Because you must hear this. And we're going to show you this tonight on television as well. But you must hear this in order to have the president's context understood, his comments. Let me just say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that upon the conclusion of the evening, I ran into several people that you all know if you watch television. I, I'm not going to mention any names because I frankly did not get permission to do so, but these are prominent people, prominent journalists, and uh, prominent liberals, too, who are not necessarily journalists. And if I heard it once, I heard it seven times. Rush, you should demand a full-fledged public apology from the President of the United States for what he called you tonight. You do not allow the President of the United States to call you a racist and get away with it. I um, listened intently and eagerly to uh, these people and their comments about it. It was a buzz. What is interesting to me, ladies and gentlemen, is that this was, among the many things that happened at this dinner, this is the thing that had most everybody talking, yet you won't read about it. I scoured newspapers today, and if it's back page, it's anything. It's nowhere. It's not even on the back page. This is not an off-the-record dinner. C-SPAN's cameras were there capturing this comment. Those of you who've watched C-SPAN saw it. Uh, and uh, Bill Bennett on, on Disgrace the Nation Sunday morning, the CBS show, uh, Face the Nation. Um, <laughs> it's a little inside lingo. On, on Face the Nation, uh, the president uh, was, was called into question by Mr. Bennett as to just what his priorities are for making the comment he made about me. Now, again, um, we're going to play for you audio from Thursday night's television show because this is what the uh, president referred to. You're going to hear me introduce a piece. It is John Conyers, congressman from Michigan, querying Janet Reno about the Waco operation. And then there are my comments following the video clip that we played. That clip takes two minutes. You will hear two minutes of Janet Reno being queried, uh, questioned, uh, interrogated, berated, abused, and treated rudely by Congressman Conyers, and then my comments follow. You ready in there? By the way, Lo Bianco's the broadcast engineer. For the last five minutes, he's been sitting here with his finger on the start button for the machine that has the... Are you ready now? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please listen. Here comes that which caused the president to make a comment about me, which many have thought to be entirely inappropriate. Here we go. Well, hearings began on Wednesday afternoon about what we did in Waco and why. John Conyers is an angry Democrat from Michigan, and he decided to try to make a name for himself by taking on the Attorney General Janet Reno. This is a full two-minute clip. But it's just amazing. You don't see this happen much uh, when a Democrat is talking to a Democrat or Republican to Republican. These people are from the same party. This is amazing. Take a look. You did the right thing by offering to resign. You did exactly the right thing. And now I'd like you to know that there is at least one member in the Congress that isn't going to rationalize the death of two dozen children that weren't cultists, they weren't nuts, they weren't criminals, they happened to be the parents of people and they were innocently trapped in there. I haven't tried to rationalize the death of children, Congressman. I feel more strongly about it than you will ever know. But I have neither tried to rationalize the death of four ATF agents. And I will not walk away from a compound where ATF agents have been killed by people who knew they were agents and leave them unsurrounded. I will not authorize a military excursion with the forces of the military into that compound with a direct assault such as what you might expect in a military situation. I will stand by and be proud of the FBI as it used its restraint. But most of all, Congressman, I will not engage in recrimination. I will look to the future, try to learn everything I can from this situation to avoid tragedies such as this in the future. Are you concluded? 
I'm not concluded if you have further questions of me, sir. Well, I consider that a non-responsive answer. You did not ask me a question, sir. You asked me if I had any comment, and well, I, I responded with my... I consider non-responsive comments. Do you have a question of me, sir? I have more questions of you than I'll ever get time to put before you. I am prepared for as long as you would like to question me, sir, and well, I will come to your office. Well, ask the to give me some more time. I will come to your office and be prepared to answer any question at any time that you may ever have about anything that I have ever done. Well, I'll, I'll thank the gentlelady and accept her invitation. Put this woman in charge of the Bosnian operation now. Man, oh man, I've, Conyers got an axe to grind there. And uh, how many of you, I just want to get a quick sample. <clears throat> Who, do you, do you think he was rude? Yes. You do. Whether she did the right or wrong thing, was she rude? Yes. Okay. She was not rude, but he was. Right. Okay. Now, do you think that because she's a woman and he's a man and you're not supposed to mistreat the woman, or was it just his attitude? Yeah, I thought he was rude, too. I, I thought it was unnecessary. He's grandstanding. And <clears throat> are you concluded? What is that? It sounds like a disease. <laughs> All right. Now, you've heard... Everything that the president obviously heard as he watched this show, or his speechwriter. Now let's go to Saturday night, two days later. The White House Correspondents' Dinner in Washington, D.C., and near the beginning of the president's remarks. I've been so called too fat by Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> Do you like the way Rush took up for Janet Reno the other night on his program? He only did it because she was attacked by a black guy. <laughs> Now, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. There is the comma. Recue that again, Lobianco, so that we can... First off, the fat business. I don't mind that. Uh, I've never called him fat, but um, I, the only thing I've ever done is suggest that the reason they were having trouble finding investors for that jogging track is that investors want to see signs of success. And he's been jogging for a couple of years, and there doesn't look to be too many signs of success. But I don't care about that. That's, that's harmless. But here you have the President of the United States trying to be funny. I'll grant it. He's trying to be funny. And look who it is that makes these supposedly insensitive, intemperate remarks based in race. Throughout the entire period on my television show where I played and commented upon the confrontation between Reno and Conyers, not once did I reference the fact that he was black in any way, shape, matter, or form. I simply talked about his party affiliation and his behavior versus her. Many people suggest that what the president did was accuse me of being a racist. And many said, Rush, you don't let the president of the United States call you a racist without demanding a national apology, a public national apology. You just don't have that happen. When the president of the United States says it, as is the case with most everything presidents say, it is given considerable weight. Well, I want you to listen to it one more time. Listen to his comments one more time, and you be the judge. I've been so called too fat by Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> Do you like the way Rush took up for Janet Reno the other night on his program? He only did it because she was attacked by a black guy. <laughs> I've been wondering about these grades on 100 days. You, you can't imagine how disappointed I am by that, this whole grade thing, because my mother still keeps all those report cards on her refrigerator. Well, we gave him an A in sex education. He's, he's doing well on our report card. I don't know if he's talking about ours or not. Um, whether the president apologizes to me or not, I'm going to extend here the hand of friendship and understanding myself. I'm going to be bigger than he about this. I'm going to apologize to the president. Mr. President, I, I sincerely apologize to you, sir, for failing to realize, for failing to understand that coming to the defense of a white cabinet member of your administration would automatically qualify me as a racist. But given the way people such as your staff and maybe even you think about race relations in this country today. To defend a white person is to be racist. And so I plead guilty. And I promise, Mr. President, from this day forward to never objectively examine 
the work of your cabinet members and assess my honest opinion thus. I will automatically conclude that whenever they are involved in a confrontation with a black person, that they deserve to lose, that they deserve to be treated rudely, that they deserve to be treated without respect, that they deserve to be treated with contention without reason, simply because their adversary is black, because to support your attorney general, simply because she's white and a woman, qualifies me as a racist, the way you think. So the days of defending your administration, when deserved, are over on this show. Thank you for teaching me a valuable lesson. Back in a moment. You're listening to the EIB Network on 77 WABC. The doctor of democracy, Rush Limbaugh, heading up the Limbaugh Institute for Advanced Conservative Studies. Happy you're with us as we kick off a brand new week of broadcast excellence and superiority. Now, ladies and gentlemen, over 18 million tuning in on 600 radio stations, the 600th to be announced soon. Uh, we are now being listened to at any one time, ladies and gentlemen, by 4.6 million Americans and Guamians. You see, we do reach Guam. Well, let's go to the phones. We'll start in Zachary, Louisiana with Denise. Hello. Hi, Rush. Hi, this is just fantastic to speak with you. Thank you. I just wanted to tell you, Rush, that your comments that you just made about Janet Reno, you know, I watched the other night and uh, on TV when that uh, air program was on, and, you know, when you first came on and said that the president had accused you of being a racist on that show, I remembered your comments, and I'm thinking, what is he talking about, okay? And then all I can say is you are pure class. With what you just made a public statement to President Clinton, you are pure class, and if he has never made a buffoon of himself before now, he most certainly has at this point. You really think so? I absolutely think so, and I know I'm not alone. No way. You know, I, I want to make a, 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 an observation. You remember when these Republicans gathered at their private little roast somewhere, Oliver North and some other guys, and they made some jokes that the press didn't like. They made some gay jokes and they did some, uh. some other things. You remember the, pr the press outrage, the moral outrage oh, led oh, of course. about how bigoted and homophobic and all that those guys were. And, I, and I, I talked to Colonel North. I said, Colonel, you got to understand there's a double standard. It's a higher standard for conservatives. We, it, it, you know, it, it's very difficult being a conservative. We are constantly under siege, under attack. We're always being scrutinized. Here, true, here, is, but... here is the President of the United States <laughs> making the comment that, I mean, this is a barroom joke that you would, that you would tell. That's what I mean. For the President of the United so States, he's place. only defending her because she, he's talking about a fellow Democrat That's right. on a very important House committee he just called a black guy. <laughs> Unbelievable. And, and I'm, I was, uh, I, I was, I was, you know, I looked around, I poked, was he talking about me? I was at the USA Today table. I was their guest. I, by the way, I should thank Judy Keene. She invited me. She had a great, uh, gave me a great time. Peter Pritchard, the uh, the editor of USA Today, where they were, they were oh, nice people. I, I enjoy getting to meet these people who don't know me. They think I'm going to show up as a fire-breathing dragon. <laughs> They're a little disappointed when they find out I'm a harmless, nice, boring guy. With a lot of class. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks you very much. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad you called. You keep it up. Okay, Denise. Okay. Thanks very much. Let's see who's next on the show. Let's go to uh, Oklahoma City. or No, you want to, which one? Oak, Oak City. Richard, hello. Welcome to the uh, Rush Limbaugh program. Hi, Rush. Megadittos from the University of Anita Hill in a Thanks. conservative outpost. Hey, by the way, I met David Brock on Saturday night. The author of this book on Anita Hill had a great conversation with him. He finally made the Today Show today, but they had Charles Ogletree on with him, who was Anita Hill's lawyer during the hearings. I'll tell you more about this as the afternoon progresses or as the show progresses. But yes, glad you called. Well, I had a comment Friday on your last hour. You had uh, people who thought Clinton was wonderful mm -hmm. in his hundred days, and you had a man about the energy tax. Yeah. And he said America was so inefficient, we needed to learn to conserve. A study just released by the Global Climate Coalition from Washington, D.C. says that the U.S. leads the world in energy efficiency. We do consume 24% of the world's energy, but that's because we have greater distances to travel. Our cars have increased in fuel efficiency yeah. twice as much as the rest of the world. Right. Well, that's, those are excellent points, and that's just another way of saying things I always say. We clean up our messes better than anybody in the world. We lead the world in the technology of cleanup. In this business of using 24% of the world's resources, and they say that's, we're selfish and greedy, and we're destroying the planet. 
if you just took the United States and erased it from the map, just, just get rid of the United States, it still means that 75% of the world's resources are being used other places, not us. It's a great, uh, great comment. I'm glad you called, Rich. I'm going to expand on this in the uh, next half hour. Stay where you are. We'll be back. Right after this, more Rush on WABC. Rush Limbaugh, the doctor of democracy, championing the American way. And the excellence in broadcasting network. Rugged individualism, self-reliance, and accepting responsibility for one's actions. And most importantly, having the courage to face and believe the truth. 800-282-2882 to Houston. David, hello. Welcome to the EIB Network. Make it dittos, Rush. Thank you. Hey, this is a first-time call for me. Well, I'm glad you made it through. I am, too, because I really want to talk about what you just said about uh, what they said. Um, the president, that is. Mm -hmm. Rush, I think you just mentioned that afterwards uh, about how he called this person a black guy. Right. I'm a black, Afro-American, whatever they want to call me. You know, I'm a person first. And I, I'm, I get so fed up with all these titles everybody's trying to put forth and, you know, just to describe what they are, where they're coming from. And this was really, I think it was just a, that the president was just making another example of how hypocritical he is by, um, like, just what you said, calling this person a black guy. If it had been a Republicans that had done it, they would have been all in the newspaper. And just the fact that he gets a few laughs off of this guy, and I think he's really trying to, to get more rebounding off of you, Rush, than anybody because of the fact that I've never heard a president mention anybody in the, in the uh, media that was attacking him like that, pay so much attention to somebody. You know, it's, it's obvious you're making a big difference in, in what's happened up there. Well, I, I tell you, that, <laughs> that was a little surprising um, because it, 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 it was, it was um, kind of a blind-sided shot. And I was, I was still kind of explaining to people that I never called him fat. When, the, when that thing about the, the black guy attacking Reno came, and I, I didn't, in fact, I, I didn't hear it. Uh, w w uh, I was still explaining to the people at USA Today, I never called him fat either. All I ever said was that a jogging track, was, you know, we haven't seen too many results of that, so that's why they had trouble getting investors. You know, Rush, I But wait, know. and then I, I heard him say, he's here tonight, and so I jabbed somebody, and I said, he's still talking about me. <laughs> and they said, uh, yeah, but nobody, a lot of people didn't understand it because they didn't know who the black guy was. They didn't know what he was talking about because they hadn't seen either my show or weren't aware that Conyers had taken after Reno the way he did. And so there were a lot of people scratching their heads going, what the hell is he talking about? Uh, and to those people, without even knowing, I mean, to imagine this, imagine telling a crowd of people, that you don't know, or, or that you're not sure know totally what you're talking about. Yeah, well, Russia's only defending that woman because he, she was being attacked by a black guy. I mean, that is, you know, that, that really, that, it's a base thing to, uh, to say uh, at any time, and especially within those types of surroundings, and, and if you're president. It's, a, it, it's really, a, uh, uh, even if you're going to say that, there's another better way to say that, it, it, just in terms of the words that you would choose. Uh, but I, 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 I am, I'm still amazed that it happened. I come from a military background, Rush, and uh, we never meet to know. You know, you, you stay away from that. That just brings out, um, it, you don't want to point at specific. Okay? Let me tell you something. Those, those are the kinds of things that when, when uh, people say um, the politically correct crowd moves into action and tries to get those people banned, that's called discrimination, it's called prejudice, it's called all kinds of things. And you heard the crowd. Play it again, little Bianca. I want you to listen to the crowd reaction, ladies and gentlemen. There was nervous laughter, and eventually the... Uh, you're not sure whether it's boos or oohs. There were some boos, but I think he's right, too. Had, had that been George Bush... I want to tell you something else about this, by the way. This is my second White House Correspondence Day. And... Elaine Boozler was, was the comic, and there were a lot of people that I talked to afterwards who thought she had used questionable taste in using some of the language and subject matter, given her audience, the President of the United States sitting there. Uh, there were uh, uh, a, a number of, of people who said not one time did anybody tonight take a hit at Clinton. Nobody took a shot at him. Rush, you should have been here when Reagan was president. I mean, these things were roasts. Everybody would stand up and just impugn and laugh at and make fun of Reagan. And Reagan never responded personally in an, in an attack fashion. 
to anybody in the media. He never did it. And you think back, folks, he didn't. I wrote about this in The Way Things Ought to Be. It's one thing Reagan never did. Never got personal, never got mad, never came back at him. And and uh, Clinton, Clinton gets free ride. Clinton's got more people in that room Saturday night who want to love him. And a White House press corps. Washington, inside a Beltway journalist, they want to love this guy. If there's anybody who wants him to succeed, it's these people. And um, he was lecturing them, and he was a little defensive throughout the whole night, I thought. But not one person took a shot at him. Last year, Paula Poundstone was a comedian, and she just was... Rel- I mean, she died in 20 minutes, and, uh, and was perceived to be very disrespectful of the president and Mrs. Bush by... Uh, by a number of people. Elaine Boozler, of course, thought that, that everybody in there was on her side because they love Clinton. So there, there's, a, there's a social comment that can be made about that, too. But listen again to, his, listen again to the comment now and, and to, the, uh, to the crowd reaction. I've been so called too fat by Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> Do you like the way Rush took up for Janet Reno the other night on his program? He only did it because she was attacked by a black guy. <laughs> Here, isn't he? So there you uh, you have a the little smattering of applause in the background, some boos and oohs. So uh, David, anyway, I, I cut you off here a minute ago. You're trying to make a point, and I want to let you finish it before I hung up. Hey Rush, uh, I just want to say, you know, I've talked to a lot of people that have heard and listened to you, but I understand uh, people from all races. I'll say, I won't, you know, I don't understand. I guess it's just that they got to go that route. They got to be sticks in the mud and stay that that route. You you are doing a lot to let people see what's happening up there. If, if you weren't out there, I, I, don't, know, I don't know what we'd do. Well, that, uh, you know, you'd manage because you're who you are. That's what you'd do. That's the whole point. I mean, you're gonna, you, you'd manage it. Don't be ridiculous here. It's, but it is nice to have a friend, and I feel the same way about you. So I appreciate your comment, and I appreciate your call. I, uh, more than you know. We have to uh, take a quick uh, break yeah, let's go ahead and do it, Lobianco. Stay on format. Get in good practice. Back in just a moment. You're listening to the EIB Network on 77 WABC. On January 20th, did President Bill Clinton declare war on productive Americans? How can you fight back? Send for the Clinton Era Survival Kit. Yours absolutely free from the American Spectator. Sealed in a confidential tamper-proof pouch, the Clinton Era Survival Kit provides exclusive reports on Bill, Hillary, and their plans to raise your taxes, radicalize the legal system, and indoctrinate your children. This is inside information the liberal news media wants suppressed at all cost. You'll get all this free, plus an up-close profile of the man most feared by the Clinton administration, Rush Limbaugh. Call 800-441-5757 to get your free, sealed, confidential Clinton-era survival kit, along with 12 issues of the American Spectator, the nation's most fearless magazine for just $34.95. Remember, it's President Clinton now. He's fit, he's rested, and he's coming after your wallet. Call 800-441-5757 for your free Clinton-era survival kit. Call today, call now. 800-441-5757 and ask for the American Spectator. What do you do, Lobianco? Bring some bumper music from home? <laughs> I knew it, he did. We're back and welcome. Glad you're with us, Rush Limbaugh, the excellence in broadcasting network. My friends, let me suggest one other remote possibility, but nevertheless, a possibility. It is, uh, you know what you ought to do? We ought to go back and find Newsweek, uh, one of those January issues of Newsweek where they predicted that it would be me and Perot that would be the biggest thorns in his side. It could well be that he sought to discredit me amongst a friendly press corps, or at least a sympathetic press corps. Remember, in our society today, one of the quickest ways to tarnish someone for a long, long time, maybe forever is to get this notion started that they're racist, bigot, or what have you. Uh, it, 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 the Jimmy the Greek, Al Campanis, long gone, see you later, forever. Uh, and uh, it's been suggested to me by some that this may have been a uh, an attempt to whisper the word racist, not really say it, but whisper the word racist, and hope that a pebble then rolling to the press corps becomes a boulder. And the boulder then takes on a life of its own at me. President calls someone racist. It must be true. That's why this is so incredible a thing, because the, the weight of a president's words are, is enormous. But he blew it. 
because A, it isn't true, and B, the, the incident that he cites as evidence. There is, uh, it, it, there's no way, you have to be convoluted, so prejudiced yourself that you are blinded by it. Uh, so, back to the phone, Seattle. Tim, hello, welcome to the Rush Limbaugh program. Hey, Rush. Hey, hey, how are you? from the conservative outpost in Seattle. Thank you, sir. I'm down in the bunker on the red phone, and I just wanted to say, you know, look at who's being racist. I mean, he's the one that made the comment about the individual that had color. Right. And also, That's exactly wanted... right. That's exactly right, and I point that out. You Nowhere in, in the clip that I played from TV do I say it or even reference it. Yeah. Also, I wanted to say that I thought he was just as unprofessional as Senator Conyers, and I was going to suggest maybe you should send both of them a copy of Verbal Advantage. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> maybe so. Good, uh, a complimentary copy. It's got a bad yeah. idea. I think we'll do that. I, th I think we'll do that. We'll we'll set. That, that's a great idea, Tim. Thanks. Uh, th thanks very much. Anything else? Um, no, that's Good. about it. We're, right. we're going to keep recording. Thank you, sir. Okay, very much. Bye. Wait, recording. Well, that's they're, they're an outpost. They're an intelligence gathering unit of the Limbaugh Institute for <laughs> Advanced Conservative Studies. Uh, Baltimore and Steve. Hello, sir. Welcome to the Rush Limbaugh program. Hello, Rush. This is Steve. Megadetto is from not far enough outside the Beltway. Thank you very much, sir. Listen, one quick congratulations. Uh, you did a fine job sticking up for the Attorney General immediately when it took him 23 hours. But yesterday I heard the most amazing thing out of our Vice President. He was on Face the Nation. And what a verbal ballet. He was asked specifically about the tax cut for the middle class, and but not getting it. And he said, well, with the bond rate so low, people can now refinance their mortgages, and we have other things in the package that will make up for it. Have you seen the New York Times today by any chance? No, I have not. Health care is going to cost 100 to $150 billion. Yes, I heard that yesterday. 100 to $150 billion, and Gore talked on Meet the Press about this insurance premium they're going to deduct. They're not going to call it a tax. They're going to actually deduct your premium from, uh, from your paycheck. Yes, and we wonder why employers will not hire. Oh, yes. I, I mean, we wonder why people won't spend. Uh, I saw, look, Gore, these people have an indefensible position to, to, uh, to, 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 to trumpet. I, it's it's, it's got to be tough for Al Gore. Even Al Gore, it's got to be tough for him to go on there and try to make this sound like it's good. It's got to be one of the most challenging things for members of this administration to go on TV and defend what's happening here. Uh, it be, it, because a lot of it is, is not, I mean, for these people to sit there and say... That with lowering interest rates, people have more disposable income, and it's Bill Clinton's policies that have given us lower interest rates, is just disingenuous. It's, it's a stretch, and it's a reach, and it's insulting to people's intelligence who know these things. And we know these things here, so we consider our intelligence to have been insulted. By the way, folks, I have found something. Uh, I have found a quote from President Clinton September 24th, last year, before the election where he said that health care wasn't going to cost anything additional. We're looking for uh, if there was any video of that announcement. If not, we'll just uh, put the words up there on the screen. TV Lingo says, we'll put the Chiron up for you. We'll make a graphic out of it for you. But uh, I, I, I agree with you, uh, uh, Steve. I, I, I think that there's just... I've had so many letters on CompuServe from people responding to Gore's appearance yesterday on Meet the Press. I don't think they're fooling people anymore. Well, the worst part of it is they think they are. Uh, we can't be that stupid, Rush. Well, the approval ratings are, are plummeting, and, and, I, and I know that there are some among us who think the American people are that stupid, Steve. Uh, I have more faith than those people who think... I think the people... Like, I, I just, I just, I've explained my theory as to why none of this stuff... Because you, you could hear all this stuff during the campaign last year. I mean, I, I was saying all this. I, everything had happened. That has happened. I told you it was going to happen. Not because I predict the future because I'm a prophet, because I know liberals and because I know Clinton. I mean, I've been governor for 10 years, 11 years. You can, you can just look. I mean, human nature is human nature, and that's what I understand. But people didn't care because they were so intent on getting rid of George Bush, and all they needed to hear from Clinton was that he felt their pain during the recession, and, and they felt, ah, oh, we got a guy who finally understands, and that's all that mattered. Everything else was irrelevant to him. Now he's the president, there is nobody else, and they're listening to what he's saying. And they don't like it. It's frustrating for people like me 
and a lot of others who were trying to tell you all last fall, hey, hey, listen, listen, but you didn't care, but now you do. Welcome to the party, even if you're late. We're still going to play Spin the Bottle. Back in just a moment. You're listening to the EIB Network. <laughs> Folks, imagine this. Imagine I had been speaking at the White House Correspondents' Dinner and had made a similar type comment about the president. You think you'd have heard about it? You think it'd have been all over the news that night? What did you mean saying that about the president of the United States? They would have asked me on Good Morning America, CBS This Morning, and the Today Show. It would have been trumpeted front page. Or if I'd have brought up anything else, any other indiscretion perhaps the president has committed. How dare you be so rude, they would have said. How dare you? Had, had it been reversed. Bruce, a cellular call, Sanibel, Florida. Welcome to the Rush Limbaugh program. Good afternoon, Rush. Hi. I'd like to uh, discuss the joke that Clinton thought he was making and putting down William Henry Harrison for having a worse hundred days. Because yeah. Because he happened to be dead for 68 of them. Yes. Well, at least William Harrison was at least an honest and brought honesty to the office. Well, and don't and forget, the President of the United States, Bill Clinton, has expressed a desire to talk to dead presidents. He wanted to talk to Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. Uh, and now he's making fun of Benjamin Harrison, or William Henry Harrison. Well, in those days, at least the honorable men were presidents. Well, now let's look, look, look. I, I want to, I'm going to keep this on a high road. I don't, I don't want to turn this into a personal... What I've always uh, done on this program, when it, when it, when it comes to, to the, uh, the discussions of the president on this show, they've always been, my discussions are always based in policy. Now, sadly, ladies and gentlemen, when talking about character, some of you might think that personal, and it is, but character, as I've always said, character, you cannot separate character from leadership. And I, you can't talk about the president's positions on policies without getting personal, because you don't know from day to day what those positions are. You don't know when he says something and will later deny it, the having said it. I mean, so, but this is not to be personal. This is simply, all we do here is tell you what's happening. All we do here is chronicle for you the events of the day in a certain perspective, in a certain way, keeping you on the cutting edge. Bruce, thanks for the call. Appreciate it. Uh, this is Pete in Burbank, California. Hello. Hello, Rush. No uh, mega dittos from this liberal, only three moral reasons why we should aid uh, Bosnia. The first reason is that the country of Yugoslavia was an artificial entity created by the League of Nations after World War I. That is by the United States, Britain, and France. Yeah, you're but, right. You're right. You're right. It was an amalgamation. And so we have a moral duty when that thing flies apart to, to, to do it in the least violent manner. Moral reason number two. After we put the these six republics, six different peoples under a Serbian uh, autocratic uh, despotic king for between World War I and II. When, World War, when the Nazis overran the country, we sided with the communists Pete. and we made sure the communists had total and complete victory Pete. and the peaceful people were abused and oppressed uh, for another 40, 50 years. Pete, I don't disagree with you then. And then, and then we'll watch one more reason, a third reason. Now to rub salt in the wound, we lent this Serbian communist government, 30, 20 to $30 billion, most of which they spent to, to buy arms with, and those rockets and guns and ammunition and tanks that you see raining down on uh, helpless women and children was bought and paid for by American taxpayers. I don't know why you call here and say no dittos or whatever. I don't, what, where, where if I said, you people, that I am opposed to action, you are confusing me, I guess. With some other conservatives, would you grant me the status of being an independent thinker for crying out loud? What have I said about this? You define victory, and I go. I'm for it. You just, but you got to do that first, or it's not going to work. And Rush will be right back, right here on WABC. Yes. Good morning, Rush. Many Hi. mega dittos from the Grand Canyon. Thank State. you for calling, sir. I would just uh, wanted to say, Rush, that I am very, very angry at what the president said. I thought it was uh, kind of childish of him in a way. I mean, you never even brought up uh, Senate, uh, Congressman Conyers, is it? Conyers. Conyers' uh, race, the color of his skin, or anything. And then for the president to try to get a cheap joke, a cheap laugh, by saying that you are a racist, racist is just preposterous. 
Well, you think that's what he was trying to do is call me a racist? He never done no, no, well, that. He way, didn't use those words, but I know, I know. Clearly, yeah. you know, you can you can do you can do quite a lot of damage to somebody if you whisper that word and it and, that's and, true. And that's it takes true. takes hold. Uh, tell me, Rush, do you think he might have been just a little politically incorrect himself there? Well, yeah. You know, and maybe that's the whole not, point. Uh, Maybe he's not reading his own democratic politically. No, those no, it's hypocritical. Those people that's can get true. away with the liberals. That's why I say liberalism is the most gutless choice you can make. That's right. You're right. And and uh, this just proves, like, even after all of this, mm -hmm. um, well, I, I look. I, let me just put it to you this way: if the situation were reversed, had I been the one to make these kinds of comments or make any comment unrelated to anything the president's done or said, if I made it unjustified. Attempt at humor that failed, uh -huh. and it was. You, I guarantee you, you would have heard about it. If right. it happened Saturday night, you would have heard about it yesterday. Correct. It yep. would have been all. They would have had special editions of the newspaper. Exactly. Uh, exactly. And all that, and uh, you know, this is this is not even back page. This is yeah. this is no page. This is it's incredible. Well, it's an well, off, off the record event, of course. Yeah, no, of course. C-SPAN with their television. It's off the record event. That's true. Well, I've so always much. said that the uh, uh, president was a simple-headed gherkin, but. Uh, that's just my personal opinion. <laughs> well, uh, it's yours. It's your opinion. So, uh, you, those of you in Albuquerque, you can, it's, it's going to be good. And sorry you're going to miss it. Uh, Mick, hello. Welcome to the program. Howdy, Your Honor. It's good to hear from you, sir. How are you, sir? I'm fine. I couldn't be better. Well, it was interesting. I couldn't either. I just got back from a little south of Waco after all the conflagration happened. Uh, however, uh, you hit my hot button talking about somebody coming to burn your house. Yeah. And what you do is walk outside with your 45 and you say, Heidi, would you like to repent? <laughs> <laughs> what is it, uh, sexual penetration upon you? Uh, that's what the man said to me when I showed him my 45 that day. Sexual <laughs> penetration upon you and then you, left. You remembered. Oh, Mick, who would forget that? <laughs> who would forget that? Well, well I, what's up? What's up? Uh, what do well, you I'm going to tell you. I have shaved my beard. Trim my mustache, cut my hair off my shoulders, and I'll be in Fort Collins. Oh, you're going in for the, uh, you're going in for Dan's bake sale. Well, there's an old boy up in uh, Hamas Springs who owns a Hamas Mountain Inn. Yeah. Named Bill Young, and Bill has organized a New Mexico contingent to come up, and I'll be bringing my New Mexico flag that flew over the New York World's Fair back in '63. Is that right? And we're going to be sitting there with our group. So I'll be there. You going to bring a barbecue pit? Uh, no. No, you told me not to do that last time I talked I to you. I didn't say don't bring a barbecue you pit. You said it wouldn't be a good idea. It wouldn't be a good idea to barbecue what you barbecue on. Well, no, barbecue. you're right. I I got a couple <laughs> of Weimar honors last night, so I'm working on chili right now. No, no. no <laughs> you know, Doris, i tell you something. Doris Day called me. Oh, really? Off the air about... Uh, Most beautiful woman on earth. Uh, you know she is, and and uh, my she ended up talking to my mother for about a half hour, and and they got along real great. Oh, and, I, I and, think and she's, Doris, I've been in love with her since I was a baby. Really? Yes. Well, it, it was puberty for me. <laughs> but uh, well, you know, I was an old. I'm an old man. Yeah, you're one of these IBM guys. Well, you got out of there in the nick of time. Well, I wrote a letter about that yesterday. Well, I'll see it at the bake sale. Anyway, I say about Doris Day. Yes. Doris Day, as you know, is very much concerned that we are uh, using animals incorrectly in testing, and she's very much convinced that we are, as a society, too cruel to animals. She called to talk to me about it. She really did. She called to tell me she's a big fan of the show, and we had a wonderful conversation, and she ended up telling me that, that uh, she was sometimes is distressed uh, at my uh, animal rights update. Does she know that they're wonderful to eat? Uh, well, so I, I, certain ones, yes. I'm, I, I, <laughs> She's she's more concerned about the testing. I I have found that, that people who are concerned about animal testing think of all animals as pets. Oh uh, yeah, one, right. one of, and, and Lovely little brown-eyed bambies. Yeah, done more to hurt deer hunting in the world than anything else. Right. But you'd like her. But I'm just when you start oh, I, talk, I, when I you love start talking. I'm sorry when you start talking about barbecuing Weimaraners, I think of Doris Day and I cringe. Maybe <laughs> she's a lovely lady, and this pains her to hear you talk. Oh, about I'm sure it does. Well, look, I, I'm looking forward to meeting you if I get a chance to go there myself. Uh, Lobianco is now putting in his request. He wants to go, too. So, snurdly, everybody wants to go to this thing, folks. Don't be left out. There's more Rush on the way on WABC. Hi, how are you? Hi, Rush. How are you? Good. Thanks for calling. Thank you. It's a thrill to get through to you. Uh, the reason I'm calling, I was at the Derby, the Kentucky Derby, this weekend. And President Bush was there. Uh-huh. And he came out. He was up on Millionaire's Row, of course. And he came out to the crowd 
oh, between six and eight times, you have never heard more cheering in your entire life than you did for Bush. Oh, Everybody really? was yelling, come back, George, we need you, come back, George. Oh, it was just great. And also, ironically, Virginia Clinton was there. Well, she never showed her head over the, you mean, uh, the president's mother. Virginia Kelly. Or Cl Kelly, that's right. She was there, too, but she didn't show her head. So I guess she realized that she was in a rich Republican crowd there. Anyway, there was this cab driver we had from the Steelbach down to the uh, Churchill Downs. And uh, I don't know how your name came up. My dad and I were in the cab. It just happens. It just happens. Anyway, he was kind of your FM type. Long-haired maggot infested. Right. Yeah. He loves you. He said, boy, I'm going to be rich like Rush. I'm going to run my cab down to that track 20 times today if I have to. I'll be there until the last person at the track is gone. He was just great. He loves you. So I just wanted to let well, you know that you do have some FM types that are on your side. Hey, oh, I know. They're all over the place out there. They really are. If I, this show knows no boundaries. We have people from all ages. We have people from all religions. We have people from all ethnic groups. We have people from all neighborhoods. We have people all three sexes listen to this show. We span all of the human spectrum to acquire and hold our audience. Jack in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Hello. Jack. We'll put him on hold and go back to him later. Denver, Colorado. Dan, hello. Welcome to the Rush Limbaugh program. Well, thank you, sir, for having me. I'm a first-time caller. My and, pleasure. Uh, Welcome. I'm a 28-year-old person, uh, guy, and, uh, you know, I, I've come to the conclusion that this country, uh, the, the people in this country are a bunch of sheep. Some of them are. Well, I mean, look at the people who followed Mr. Koresh. Sheep. Oh, but there are not many that followed Mr. Koresh, and so what? Well, that, and then the people who uh, voted for, well, uh, our current president... Yes. Such a sheep. Well, no. You know what? They, uh, now, some of them were. Yeah, some of them were.